by Harold. I'm going to present, I'm going to introduce you now, okay? Great. And then over to you. Good morning, everybody. We are so delighted all the way from Tokyo to what's in that unexpectedly. Oh, Harold's here, you can see us all from this camera. So if you give this camera here a wave, I hope you can see us, Harold. Yeah, wave him back. Harold, unexpectedly, he was always, you were always coming in from um, Duke, weren't you? Um, you were going to stream it, but now you're streaming in from Tokyo, hence the time changed, because we thought 7.30 p.m. was a bit nicer than midnight, and we're really glad that Professor Harold G. Kearney, and Dean, is going to speak to us today, Professor of Psychiatry and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University, he is also an adjunct professor at King Abdul Aziz University in Saudi Arabia and at Ningjia Medical University in China. We are so delighted that you could join us, and I'm so embarrassed that everybody was too scared to um, introduce you um, to who I asked, so now it's me. Um, but thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can you all hear me? Okay. Good, good. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here and speaking to you from Okinawa, Japan, uh, for reasons that I really am not excited about being. I'd rather be back home, but it is as it is. And I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to share my screen now and talk to you about a subject that is quite dear to my heart, and that is the relevance of spirituality to good mental health. Okay, so I'm going to start here. I want to be sure everybody can see my screen. There we go. So uh, we're going to um, start with a bit of an introduction and then look at these terms, religion versus spirituality. Are they the same or are they different? Then look at research on religion and mental health, review some of the physical health consequences of the effects that a religion and spirituality have on mental health, and then describe a theoretical model to explain the effects and then make some conclusions and provide you with some further resources. And then we can have a little discussion. So hopefully this won't go much beyond 25, 30 minutes at most. Um, and then we can have questions and discussion. So religion versus spirituality, are they the same or different? Uh, religion, on the one hand, is unpopular, potentially divisive. Spirituality, on the other hand, is quite popular. It's inclusive, common to all, but largely self-defined. Through most of recorded history, up until about the last 30 years, spirituality and religion were considered largely the same. Within the past 30 years though, with secularization, spirituality in academic settings has become separate from religion. So I'm gonna show you uh, what I'm talking about here. So spirit, the definition of spirituality has been changing. This is the traditional definition um, spirituality used to be viewed as a subgroup of religious persons who were devoutly religious, such as the clergy. And then there were more superficially religious people, and then those who were neither religious nor spiritual, the secular. So this was, uh, this was easy to understand. Uh, one could administer a scale, for example, 
and those who scored high on the scale, a religiosity scale, they would be considered spiritual, and those who scored lower on it would be religious, and those who scored at the very bottom would be considered secular. So that is how things were grouped. And then you could compare the mental health, both the positive mental health and the negative mental health of these three different groups, the both spiritual and religious, those who were only religious and those who were neither spiritual nor religious. Okay, now this is the modern understanding. Notice that spirituality has expanded beyond religion. So there are now individuals who consider themselves spiritual, but not religious. And then again, these individuals here are neither spiritual nor religious. Now this isn't too bad because you can compare the mental health and the physical health between these three groups. Um, you know, so that's clear. Now, the only thing is that this is what's happened further. Spirituality has grown so broad that it has now encompassed mental health, the positive aspects of mental health, such as meaning and purpose, connectedness with others, existential well being, peace, hope, uh, these kinds of things. Now, you have, if you're going to compare these three groups, you know, these poor secular guys and gals don't have a chance because, you know, spirituality has been defined a priori as good mental health. And it's their, the spiritual person's health is always going to be better than that of the secular person, simply by the definition itself. So that's not so good for research. So here are my final thoughts on definitions of spirituality and religion. When discussing the research, I'm going to be mostly using the term religion since that is what can be measured quantitatively and is sufficiently distinct to avoid conceptual overlaps with mental and physical health, which are the outcomes that we're examining. When measuring spirituality for research, measures should not be contaminated with positive psychological states and positive character traits, again, like meaning and purpose, being connected with others, et cetera. Those, those really tend to be more reflective of mental health. Um, this will help to avoid defining spirituality a priori as good mental health and will then, um, you know, if you do that, that will avoid the tautological associations that would otherwise result. Basically, if you look at the relationship between spirituality and mental health, and you measure spirituality by indicators of mental health, of course, you're going to have an association, but it's going to be tautological. It's going to be meaningless, uninterpretable. In clinical settings, however, a broadly inclusive term such as spirituality should be used and defined by patients themselves, okay? So it's a great term to use in clinical settings where you don't have to be so specific as you have to be in research. In clinical settings, the purpose is to maximize connection with the patient, promote engagement, and promote conversation. And spirituality is a wonderful term for that. But in terms of scientifically identifying whether or not spirituality is related to mental or physical health, you know, it just doesn't work out so well. That term just, so basically, I'm going to use religion, which we pretty much, most people agree on that term, uh, you know, having to do with the transcendent beliefs and practices uh, that were, you know, that are adopted by a community of believers with common beliefs and practices concerning the transcendent. So I'm going to talk about religion. So what about research on this topic? So here are some sources of the research. Um, if some of you would like to, you know, what are the specific studies? And, and if you want to review those, the third edition of the Handbook of Religion and Health is coming out uh, later this year, probably be out in December. Um, it's a massive text, about 2,000 pages. 
uh, almost 600,000 words. Um, it really reviews the latest research on this topic. Now, there is a book that's currently out called uh, Religion and Mental Health Research in Clinical Applications. That's, that's one that I wrote in 2018. And it, it covers a lot of the material, but it's nowhere as comprehensive as the third edition of the handbook. And there are a couple of articles here. The British Journal of Psychiatry Advances has published a couple of our articles reviewing recent developments in research in psychiatry, the connections between religion and psychiatry, and then uh, religion and psychiatry in terms of clinical applications. I'm not gonna be covering much of the clinical applications today. I, again, in 25 minutes, I'm gonna be focusing primarily on the research. So let's start with depression. Depression is the most common emotional disorder in the world and is really the second most disabling of all health conditions. The only health condition that is more disabling than depression is, is heart disease. And then comes depression. So worldwide, it's an important and a common condition. Now, religious involvement is related to less depression and faster recovery from depression. So in the second edition of the handbook, the one prior to this third edition, we did a systematic review, identified 444 quantitative studies. And of those studies, 272, a little over 60%, found that religious people experienced less of that, recovered more quickly from depression, and that religious interventions were effective in reducing depressive symptoms. And in that systematic review, 6% of studies found more depression among the religious. Here's a recent study. This is out of the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, this is a large study involving a um, a large sample of young people, almost 10,000, average age of 23. They were followed for up to six years, and they looked at the risk of developing depression based on their frequency of attendance at religious services. And they found that there was about a little more than a 30% reduction in risk of experiencing depression among those attending religious services at least once a week. So that's among young people, average age 23. Let's look at suicide. Our systematic review found that there were 141 studies in the year 2010. This was the 2012 edition of the handbook and it reviewed all of the research prior to 2010. So there were 141 studies of which 75% found less suicidal thoughts less completed suicide and less suicide attempts. Here is some more recent research. This was a random sample, national sample of the US population, a little over 20,000 persons over the age of 18. And um, they uh, followed these individuals for 18 years. And what they found was that after controlling for gender, age, size of the household, previous suicide attempt, marijuana use, after controlling for all of that, there was an 84% reduction in risk of completed suicide among those attending religious services at least twice a month, twice a month or more. Now you're gonna see a pattern here. You're gonna see just how important attending religious services seems to be. Now, I understand that attendance in Europe and in the UK, you know, it's, it's not very high. It's, it's decreasing. And the same trend is occurring in the US. But the fact is, is that people who are attending religious services are a whole lot less likely to commit suicide. That's just what the data show. Okay, here's another study. This is 90,000 women followed for 14 years. Here, this was the Harvard School of Public Health looking at the suicide incidents per 100,000. So among these women, those who never attended religious services, the suicide rate was around seven per 100,000 per year. 
whereas among those attending at least once a week, um, it was only one per 100,000. In other words, there was a sevenfold difference in rate of completed suicide during this 14 year follow up study. It was published in JAMA Psychiatry, which is one of the top, if not the top, biological psychiatry journal in the world. Uh, even after controlling for multiple other risk factors for suicide, there was an 84% reduction in risk of completed suicide. Hazard ratio was 0 0.16 with a tight confidence interval. Now also, we're kind of shifting here uh, and we're looking at deaths of despair, deaths of despair. So what are deaths of despair? They are deaths from drugs, alcohol, or suicide. So now they're looking at 66,000 women in Harvard School of Public Health and published in JAMA Psychiatry. Once again, these are one of the few studies ever published in JAMA Psychiatry on religion. This was a 16 year prospective study. And what they found was that among these women, there was a nearly 70% reduction in risk of dying of a death of despair during that 16 year follow up. Now they also looked at men and what they found was similarly, there was a almost a 50% reduction in risk of completed of a death of despair among men who attended religious services at least once a week or more. Now let's move on to alcohol use, abuse, and dependence. Our systematic review, again, uh, that we did prior to 2010 in the 2012 edition of the second edition of the handbook, there were 278 quantitative studies of which 86% found that religious people are just less likely to use, abuse, or become dependent on alcohol. And that is religion, not just measured by attendance at religious services, but by a host of other indicators of religious involvement, private involvement, as well as public involvement. And of the best design studies, the largest studies, nine out of 10 found less alcohol use and abuse among the more religious. The same pattern you see in illicit drug use, of the 100, 185 studies that were in this systematic review, 84% found less drug use, abuse, and dependence. And uh, if you actually looked at randomized controlled trials of religious or spiritual interventions, 95% of those trials showed that a religious or spiritual intervention significantly reduced illicit drug use. <laughs> study out of the U.S., a recent study. Uh, it's an 18-year prospective study of a national random sample of 474 U.S. adolescents 11 to, ages 11 to 16 who had been referred to child protective services because of child abuse in the home. So these are young people at extremely high risk of substance use. Um, the second they get out of control of an institution or a parent, they're out there using drugs. Now, this study looked at the predictive power of importance of religion in these young people's lives. And it found that among those who indicated at baseline that religion was very important in their lives, there was a greater than 50% reduction in risk of developing a substance use disorder. So that's kind of interesting. Now let's look now at anxiety and PTSD. Now, uh, in our systematic review, we identified almost 300 studies of which about half found that religious people experienced less anxiety. Now, we also found in 11% that religious people indicated more anxiety than less religious people. Now, uh, one caveat here is that of those studies finding more anxiety among the religious, 31 of 33 were cross-sectional. And we do know that anxiety is a powerful motivator of religious involvement. So we're pretty sure that those positive associations are due to the fact that when people get anxious, what do they do? They pray, they pray or they engage in some kind of religious 
uh, activity because it helps to reduce their anxiety. And if you look at 40 experimental studies or clinical trials, in three quarters of those studies, religious or spiritual intervention significantly reduced anxiety symptoms. Now, this is a cross-sectional study. It's a, you know, it was of veterans, US veterans. There are a little over 3,000. And this is a nationally representative uh, sample of, of US veterans. And we actually uh, administered the Duke Religion Index, which is a five item measure of religiosity. So one item is religious attendance, then there's private prayer or scripture study, and then there is intrinsic religiosity, three questions on intrinsic religiosity or the, the uh, strength of a person's relationship with God. Among, and, and then the score was divided in, in half. And the, those scoring in the upper half, the high group, were compared to those scoring in the lower group, the low group. And what the finding was that uh, lifetime PTSD was more than half less likely among the high religious group. Current PTSD was 70% uh, uh, less likely among the high religious compared to the low religious group. And then we looked at some other conditions here. Major depression was likewise lower by 50% lifetime. And uh, alcohol use disorder was also lower by about a third. And then for current, it was lower by more than 70%. Again, consistent with the other findings um, from prospective studies. Now let's look at the positive side of, of mental health. We've been talking about all the negative aspects. Uh, let's look at well-being and happiness. The findings are very similar, if not even more prominent. So we identified 326 studies in the second edition of the handbook. Of those, nearly 80% found that religious people were simply happier. They had higher levels of well-being, greater life satisfaction compared to those who were less religious. And of those 326 studies, only three studies found that religious people were less happy than the less religious. And that's less than 1% of the studies. So there are, if you compare here, you've got, you got 80 times more quantitative studies finding greater well being and happiness than less. The same is true for meaning, purpose, hope, and optimism. Religious people just have more meaning and purpose in life. They have greater hope. They have greater optimism. They see things more optimistically. Um, and believe it or not, being more, be having more meaning and purpose, being more hopeful and optimistic, have consequences in terms of patients' recovery from physical health conditions as well as mental health conditions because it affects their motivation towards recovery. If somebody is has no meaning and purpose, is not hopeful, is not optimistic, why make the effort to recover? Um, you know, wh why make that hard effort if you have to mobilize yourself and it's painful? You know, you just don't do it, you know? But if you're optimistic and you're hopeful and you're, you've got a reason to live, then you're gonna work harder to get better. That just stands to reason. Social support is also higher among those who are more religious in more than 80% of the studies. Religious people just have more friends. Delinquency in crime is lower among those who are more religious in close to 80% of the studies. And that makes sense, you know, but, you know, to document this in eight out of 10 studies, you know, is pretty important. Here's a recent study, five-year prospective study of over a thousand youth and what they did was they looked at the risk of, of being arrested for the first time. And what they found was that those with individual level assets, those young people with individual level assets, which meant they participated in religion, and those with community level assets, which meant they, use, uh, they used uh, their time for religious activities, you can see there's about a 40% lower risk of being arrested for the first time 
compared to those who had no religious assets. Okay, marital stability and satisfaction. Again, here we go. <laughs> it gets boring after a while because literally all mental, social, behavioral health indicators are better among those who are more religious. Marital stability and satisfaction, there were 79 studies in our systematic review. 80 to 90% of these studies show less divorce, greater marital stability, greater satisfaction with the marriage, less spousal abuse, less cheating on spouse, more likely to have two uh, parents in the home. Okay, uh, here's a recent study out of the Harvard School. Of, the Harvard School of Public Health is doing a lot of research. They have these huge databases that they're tracking results in. And, and they've got, they, in these database, they frequently ask about religious attendance. So this was a study, a 14-year follow-up of 66,000 initially married women. These were all nurses, and they were followed over 14 years. They controlled for virtually everything in this model, including prior religious attendance in 1992. So the baseline was 1996 religious attendance. And you see here that those attending services, you know, at least once a week are are close to 50% less likely to divorce or separate. So uh, going to church together helps people to stay together. Here is a model that describes um, the effects of religious involvement on mental and social health. This is out of the, the third edition of the handbook. This is a, a sneak preview of, of that, literally, Across the lifespan, we find that uh, religious involvement is acting to reduce mental and social health problems, affecting maternal stress and substance use, affecting caregiver nurturing and support, uh, affecting the kinds of training models with regard to morals and values and the monitoring of children, um, enhancing positive cognitions in terms of healthy coping, um, enhancing social support, engagement with pro-social peers, and uh, more volunteering among those who are more religious. Religious people live healthier lifestyles. They exercise more. They eat a better diet. They don't smoke. They don't use alcohol and drugs. All of that affects their health and their mental and social health. And they make pro-social this, uh, decisions that are healthier. And it emphasizes virtues and character that are all good for mental and social health. So there's the, there is the model. Of course, it's all, in, all influenced by genetics and by gene environment interactions. So in conclusion, religious involvement is related to better mental, social, and behavioral health and improves these aspects of health when people are followed over time. Religious involvement is also related to better physical health, less functional disability, less cognitive decline with aging. I didn't go over those aspects, um, but you know the, the mental, social, and behavioral health benefits of religion uh, do carry over into physical health. Uh, these findings have huge implications for public health and healthcare costs as religious involvement becomes less common with each younger generation. Here are some further resources. We have a monthly e-newsletter where I summarize the latest research every month in the field of religion, spirituality, and health. We have a summer research workshop. I'd love to have some of you come over, come over to the United States and attend our workshop. We have people every year from the United Kingdom and from all over Europe and this year we have people from all over the world, including Africa, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, I mean, from, from literally India, Pakistan. Um, um, in, in any case, here's kind of, if you're interested, send me an email. There's my email down there at the bottom. Here, if you can't attend the reach, the research workshop, and you're, you're interested in learning how to do research in this area, here's a book you can get, 2011, that basically describes our, our workshop. 
um, in great detail. Here's our website. There's lots of information on our website that I think you'll find interesting. So I would encourage you uh, to go to our website here and just, just shop around here. There's a lot of free stuff, a lot of free stuff here. There's religious cognitive behavioral therapy videos, as well as workbooks in all different faith traditions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. We've got some CME videos on how to integrate spirituality into mental health care and physical health care and just lots of information. We've got monthly seminars as well uh, that we have posted there, videos of these seminars and PowerPoints that were delivered, uh, really people from experts in, in throughout the world giving, giving talks, all recorded here on our website. Okay, so that's it. Well, we can have some discussion, I hope. Thank you so very much indeed. And um, we've got time for a few minutes of questions. Um, if you're okay with that, Harold, too. Good, yes. Why don't you repeat the question? That would be good. We'll check that too. Can I see what hands we have in the room? Okay. Uh, and could one of my colleagues from the board help me keep an eye on where that hands were if I get lost? Thank you. So we've got, we've only got one mic, but we'll just, okay, I see these hands. The other hands will come to, we won't have time for more, and I'll start with Lindsay Van Dyke, who's at keynote this afternoon. You know you swapped with her, Harold, so we'll start here because she's nearest. Hi, Harold. So nice to see you. I'm sorry you can't see me properly on the screen there. Very interesting presentation. I was just wondering with regards to the religious connotation that you so well defined as well within your presentation. Within healthcare, where I currently work, we define religious care as part of astral, spiritual, and religious care under rites and rituals. So, what you express your faith and belief to be like. You, you probably are aware that I'm a humanist myself. And I was wondering with regards to the religious connotation you were mentioning, if it resolves around the faith aspect of religion, or if it's more around the sense of belonging and community and to have the morality within the shared wider sense of that community and that belonging. That particular group. So we're just wondering your reflection with regards to that. Okay, so I think I heard what you said. I, I have some issues with hearing and there's an echo in the room, and you know, we're going over about about seven thousand miles. And so, but I think I get what you said. I think you said, is it more about the or the benefits of religion, more about the faith aspects, or is it more about the belonging, the social kind of aspects of it and uh so so the answer to that is that every single one of these studies control for social support so they control because you don't even get it published unless you carefully control for how people how much people interact with one another other clubs that they're members of how many times are on the telephone how many times they meet together all of that is controlled for so um Yes, religious involvement includes the social dimension, but it accounts for maybe 25% at most of the effects that we're seeing. Thank you, Harold. The people who have their hands up, can you repeat your hands? Okay. I was a psychiatrist, <laughs> and I know that I was just thinking about your data about suicide and leading to the uh, increased, uh, you mentioned the increased number, uh, obviously attendance in the churches in the US. And I know that as a psychiatrist in the UK, our suicide number, I think across all age, and 90% between the US and the UK, we've got less suicide than you have. So I just wondered about other factors, obviously, that they have involved in that. Thank you for your presentation. Do you want me to repeat that, Harold, or could you hear all of that? I uh, Could you repeat it just to be sure I got it? Okay, it was about rates of incidence in the US and UK. Okay. Very UK lower, is that right? Um, and re in relation to suicide, and what are the other factors involved in rates of suicide? Because you made a specific link, Harold, with attending churches. 
when what so you said in the UK lower attendance in the UK religious wise but lower suicide rates in the UK so thoughts on that please okay so so that's an interesting observation that lower suicide rates in the UK compared to the US and uh that that makes sense uh the only thing is it's when you when you do it on the national level, when you compare national level statistics, um, it doesn't translate very well to the individual level. So that is called the sociological fallacy. Okay, a well-known term in sociology where you cannot apply national rates to individuals. For example, here in the United States, the sickest state in the union is Mississippi. And Mississippi is also the most religious state in the, in the United States. So how does that make sense? Well, it's, it's because if it weren't for their religion, there would be a lot more illness and sickness than there is now. Because again, you know, on the individual level, you see these very strong relationships with lower rates of suicide, lower rates of uh, depression, greater well-being, et cetera. But on the, at the state level, you know, there are racial issues, there's poverty, there's all sorts of things going on, you know, that account for uh, the worse health and maybe the higher suicide rates that you see in the United States, despite all the resources that we have here. We've got a lot of problems too. Thank you, thank you, Harold. Just getting your microphone to work again. Come towards me, and I'll come towards you if you don't mind. Harold, we're just getting a question. Can you make it a question which is what I want to know about is in one sentence because we're running out of time? Okay, I'll be quick. Thank, uh, thank you for your presentation. I just want to ask whether uh, you you have a, a you know a definition for happiness, um, and also second quick thing, uh, your measuring tool that you use is it purely based on the externals of religion, or is it based on faith itself? So, question about happiness and measuring tools and mics. Going on, sorry. So, Harold, that question was a double question, and your last question, which is measuring happiness and what's your definition for happiness, and what are the tools you're using for measuring? Okay, so happiness, well being, I'm using those largely synonymously. And there's a whole wide range of tools used to assess happiness and well-being. There's, uh, you know, there, there's a well-being scale, the uh, Philadelphia Geriatric Center Morale Scale. We've used that one on several times. There are happiness scales um, that are, you know, <laughs> the, the simplest thing is just how happy are you on a scale from zero to 10, where zero means you're not happy at all, to 10, you're very happy. Um, and uh, life satisfaction scales, like the life satisfaction index. Uh, uh, there's a five item measure uh, that uh, Diener developed that's used a lot for life satisfaction. So uh, that's what a lot of these, uh, these studies are, that's how they're measuring it. Um, now there are various forms of happiness. I, I kind of, this might be the question uh, you know, the, underneath the question, there are uh, there is the more transient happiness, and then there is the happiness called eudaimonia, eudaimonia that results from the consistent practice of virtues and moral behaviors. So um, that's a more enduring form of happiness, and uh, that's the one I think that's more connected with religious involvement. Although I can't guarantee that answer. Harold, I'm just going round to the microphone. Everybody, participants, we are wanting to say to you, Harold, and maybe we use our waving to this camera again to say how happy we are and how, and we can give our applause as well. Thank you.
Thank you. Some great questions. And Harold, we're delighted that we're going to be, uh, that we've been streaming this webinar around and that people have watched that way. And I know many of us on our chaplaincy networks will be wanting to come back to your presentation time and again during the next quadrennial for our own training and development and to then go back to your research and reading. So we so appreciate the time you spent with us today and all the best with the um, remaining period you have to remain in Okinawa and your return back to, to the US. Thank you so much. And it's just a delight to have been presenting to you all today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.